So I'd like to welcome, oh, no, hold on, I'll wait till it starts. There we go. All right. So I would like to welcome everybody back uh, to the uh, virtual student chapter meeting. I, I have a couple announcements before we get started, and I know Steve Tate has an announcement as well. So the first uh, announcement I would like to make is that uh, the National ABS is really happy with the way this is working. And so the bad part about that is they would like us to really formalize things. So they have asked us to get some uh, volunteers, students who would like to run for officers of the virtual student chapter. So I will send out a, a note where we request volunteers, nominations, whatever, and then we'll have a vote shortly afterwards. But I, I guess the important thing about this is absolutely congratulations because they thought this was not the world's greatest idea when we started. So uh, I appreciate everybody's effort with that. And hopefully we will get a few people who volunteer to run and uh, start organizing everything. All right, with that, let me turn it over to Steve. Hi, everyone. So I just want to make a short announcement about our AVS Prairie meeting this year. Uh, because of the current circumstances, we're going to have an online meeting. This will be on Monday, September 14th. Uh, it'll start at, uh, uh, at uh, 1 p.m. Central Time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll have uh, a couple of talks by our award winners from this year, uh, the, the Young Investigator Award and the uh, Senior Research Award. And then after that, we'll transition to an online poster session. The posters will mainly be posted on Twitter, but the presenters also have an option if they would like to, to uh, post a video of themselves presenting the poster and also to host uh, some kind of video chat room, like a Zoom room or, or like this on Google Meets or, or Teams or something like that. So we're trying to make this very dynamic so that you can adjust it to your style. We, um, we talked about just postponing the meeting until next year, but we thought this is a really important event, especially for the students and postdocs to have a chance to present their work. Uh, it looks like we may be doing online meetings for a while, so I think it's a good idea for all of us to practice our skills at presenting things online. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, there is an email announcement that'll go, in, that'll go out soon, hopefully later this week. It'll have a link to a registration form and, uh, and instructions. And um, I'm organizing the poster session, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me. We're looking for broad participation. Everyone's welcome. Our guests who are not currently part of the Prairie chapter, you guys are welcome to send your students along to present posters also. It should be a very fun event. We're gonna to try to make uh, a lot of interaction. And I should also add that there will be prizes uh, for the posters <laughs> as usual. And the event will conclude with an award ceremony to present those prizes. So I hope you can join us. It's Monday, September 14th. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Now our uh, speaker today is professional. Yeah, let's try that in English. Professor Ashley Baber from uh, the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at James Madison University. And she's here to talk about controlling selectivity by modifying model catalyst surfaces. So with that, I will turn the meeting over. All right, so I'm gonna figure out how to present. And let's see. I haven't used um, Google Meet before, so bear with me for a second. I think I'm just gonna present my whole screen and we'll see what happens. I think that usually works best. Okay, great. You can see all of yourselves for a minute, um, but now hopefully, I can't see you at all. So um, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we have okay. it perfectly. And uh, so, uh, one one thing we like to do here is I'll monitor the chat window for questions that come in okay. and I'll interrupt and ask, but it's always a good thing to uh, stop and, and ask 
for questions every, you know, 10, 15 minutes as you feel you get to a good breaking point. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Um, okay. So thank you all so much for having me here. I'm very excited uh, to, to be participating in the uh, Prairie chapter today. Um, as you heard, I'm Ashley Baber and I come from James Madison University. Um, I'm an associate professor now. And uh, you can see in this picture, I've got our home-built instrument over here, this is a surface analysis chamber. It works under ultra-high vacuum, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but I'm trying to modify gold surfaces in order to drive selectivity. But um, also, I really love the fundamental interactions between molecules and between molecules and surfaces. So I'm actually going to talk a lot about that up front as well. So let's just get started. I wanted to show you, I know at least one of you is familiar with James Madison University, which is in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, you can see we're nestled in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia and um, across campus over here. This is where the physics and chemistry building lives. And we have about 20,000 students here. Most are undergraduates. Um, we do have about 40 graduate programs, but uh, that is not in the chemistry department. So. I have undergraduate researchers who work with me. And these are some of the projects that we have been working on since I started at JMU in 2014. So you can see I'm interested in looking at small alcohols on uh, surfaces like gold and silver 111. I'm also interested in the interaction between molecules on these surfaces. And then in order to look at um, some reactivity, we, we modify uh, gold surfaces with titanium nanoparticles and then try to drive selectivity there. Um, and we're working with uh, a density functional theory, uh, theory physicist at JMU um, in the in the physics department, uh, trying to model some of these systems, and we've worked with um, several different reactions. One of which is uh, propene partial oxidation. But I'll talk a lot about our work uh, with ethanol today. So here again is our ultra high vacuum chamber. Um, of course, I have to talk about UHV at an AVS meeting, um, and so we we work under ultra high vacuum to keep our surfaces very clean. You can see on the left hand side we have OJ uh, electron spectroscopy, and we mainly focus on temperature program desorption, which um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with that, but I am going to uh, talk about it just in case not everyone is up to speed there or hasn't heard of it yet. Um, but you can see we have some um, high precision leak valves on the chamber so we're able to dose in molecules of interest onto our gold and silver surfaces and when we are running experiments we have a base pressure of um, around 5 times 10 to the negative 10 tor okay so here you can see um here's a picture so maxwell is actually in this meeting i noticed maxwell but he used to be an undergraduate researcher in my laboratory um and here you can see uh, some of the students working together to run some um, tpd experiments and you'll notice that this is an old picture because uh everyone is standing way too close to one another and not wearing masks like they should be so we can mon we can run between um, 80 Kelvin and 1,000 Kelvin. We use liquid nitrogen in order to cool our surface down. And um, I just wanted to talk about TPD very quickly, temperature program desorption, where we have a metal surface of interest. Here, this gold disc represents a gold 111 surface. And we cool it down and spray some molecules on it. And when we heat it back up, those molecules come off, and we can monitor them using quadrupole mass uh, spectrometry. And if it's an inert surface like gold 111, then if we put something like ethanol down on the surface, then we see that ethanol comes back off of the surface. And we see a plot like this. Um, if you haven't seen this before or recently, I'll just run you through this because this is mostly what I'll be showing today. So on the y-axis, you have the intensity of the uh, desorption uh, feature that's being monitored. In this case, methanol, we're looking at a mass to charge ratio of 31. And so you can see the desorption of methanol as a function of temperature. And so if we have molecules coming off of the surface at higher temperatures, that gives us information about how strongly the molecule is bound to the surface. And you can see we have a few other features that are present here, and I'll be talking about that as we go through this talk. 
I use a surface science approach in order to look at uh, model systems like Gold 111 and try to relate that to what's happening um, in a catalytic high surface area system like you can see here on the right hand side looking at uh, gold nanoparticles supported on titania powders. This is obviously a very complex system and so we use surface science in order to get a more fundamental look um, at what at what's happening on the surface. There are obviously some materials gaps between looking at single crystals and high surface area catalysts, um, but there's also a pressure gap between um, ultra high vacuum and high pressure uh, scenarios that uh, catalysis is generally run under. And so our goal is to move towards higher pressures by running ambient pressure experiments down the line. Um, and I'll talk to you about how we bridge this materials gap in order to gain a better understanding of the fundamental uh, reactivity uh, um, on these modified surfaces. In order to bridge this materials gap, um, we use model catalysts. And so you saw this picture on the, or this image on the last slide, where you have gold nanoparticles supported on titania powders. And a model catalyst system that represents that would be gold nanoparticles supported on a bulk oxide of titania. In my lab, we flip that around. So we have nanoparticles of titania on a gold 111 surface. And this is an interesting setup where we can investigate what's happening at the interface between the metal and the oxide particles. And so here you can see an ambient AFM image that was taken in my lab. And um, you can see that these protrusions across the surface are titania nanoparticles. And why do we care about titania on gold? Well, it's been shown to be active for uh, both the water gas shift reaction as well as ethanol redox chemistry. Uh, and what had been studied uh, prior to our lab's work is methanol and propanol on titania gold surfaces. That obviously leaves some space for studying ethanol. Ethanol is the simplest alcohol that has carbon-carbon single bonds, carbon-oxygen single bonds, and carbon-hydrogen single bonds. And not only is ethanol used directly as a fuel, as you know, we can go to uh, the gas station and if you have flex fuel capability in your car, you can fill your car up with ethanol. But it's also used as a chemical feedstock for the formation of acetaldehyde. And so in addition to making acetaldehyde, um, hydrogen can also be formed. And so you can get some um, really nice products out of the partial oxidation of ethanol. So we'll be looking at that a little bit later on today. Uh, but the important thing is to focus on partial oxidation and trying, trying to drive that selectivity and uh, avoid full oxidation into uh, making carbon dioxide. So with the surface science approach, I'm gonna start off with uh, the simplest system possible, looking at small alcohols on uh, gold surfaces. And today I'll focus on gold 111. And then um, I'll, I'll also talk about some intermolecular interactions between um, some molecules on a gold surface. And then we'll go into looking at titania supported um, on a gold surface so that we can look at reactivity. And again, specifically of ethanol. I guess maybe now would be a good time. Does everyone understand kind of the setup and how this will run? Looks good so far. I, I have one question sure. uh, for you. Uh, so uh, the uh, TPD peak that you showed yes. was out outstanding. Uh, in bad TPD systems, the, the peak looks somewhat more integrated. So you can tell that you've got a great system because it's a very sharp peak like that. Uh, what do you do to make sure that you don't have a problem with uh, integration? Well, uh, in order to maximize the signal, um, what we've done is um, we just talking about the experimental setup, um, we have, as you can see, a, a very large manipulator on our chamber so that we're able to move um, pretty far in any given direction within the chamber. And so um, for our experimental setup, we have um, a Hyden HAL 3F 
uh, for our for our um, mass spectrometer. And it's covered with a shroud that has a small aperture on the end. And then we bring our sample just as physically close as possible to that aperture. So the aperture is right in the middle of that gold surface um, to try it and maximize that signal to noise ratio. Uh, does that does that uh, answer your question? Yeah. So, so you actually okay. use a shroud. Is it is it differentially pumped or just? It's uh, not differentially pumped, actually. It's got, um, so it has has uh, the aperture opening at the front, um, and then it is open at the back as well. Okay. Um, so it's not differentially pumped outside of the chamber. Okay, very nice. And then we have a question in the chat window. How is the TiO2 deposited on the gold? Oh, good question. Um, so within the chamber, we have um, a homemade fil titanium filament. So I learned this uh, back from being a graduate student in Charlie Sykes group. Charlie's also here. Um, but we take a piece of tungsten, a uh, tungsten wire, and then around that. Oh, I'm going to interrupt myself for a second. Can you see my camera? I don't know if you can see me or yes. not. Oh, OK. OK. So when I talk like this, you can yes, see. Yes, we can see you. Okay, um, so we have a titanium, um, a tungsten wire, and then take very fine titanium wire and then wrap that around um, and form a filament. And so that is um, on an electrical feed through in the chamber. And then again, we bring the sample as close as possible to the titanium filament. And then we sublimate titanium from that filament in an oxygen background, most usually um, at, at room temperature. And so that it works pretty well for getting fully oxidized titania on the surface. And after we deposit it in oxygen, we run an annealing cycle. We keep the oxygen present to make sure that these uh, titania part particles get fully oxidized. So are we talking tor, millitor? Oh, uh, no. Ten to the minus oh. six tor? T uh, five times 10 to the negative seven tor of oxygen. Seven. Mm -hmm. For about, um, we'll make sure that that first oxidation cycle is about 30 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Okay. Sorry. I will just scoot back ahead. Okay. To where we are jumping off. And I'm starting from, again, just the fundamental side. Um, but I really find uh, even just looking at simple alcohols on gold to be fascinating. So let's first of all understand the control before we start making things more complex. One of the first um, experiments that was done in my lab, uh, David Boyle, who has since, since graduated, looked at ethanol on gold 111, and we uh, were not the first people to do this by any means, um, but we did look at such low coverages of ethanol on the gold 111 surface that we saw uh, several peaks appearing. Um, and that just had to do with the adsorption of ethanol on different sites on our surface. And so uh, we have this, uh, as, let, me, let me just say, as we start with very, very low coverages, we can see a saturation of this small peak uh, where you have the desorption at about 185 Kelvin. After the saturation of that peak, then we see the growth um, at 173 Kelvin. And this will continue as you see in the next slide up to higher and higher coverages. But here we're maxing out at only 0.2 monolayers of ethanol on the surface. Um, and so looking at this, at first, we're like, okay, what's what's going on there? But thinking it's probably a different adsorption site on the surface. And if we sputter our gold 111 surface and form pits across the surface because of that um, roughening sputtering procedure, and then dose ethanol directly onto that surface and run a TPD, we can see that, in fact, we have increased the desorption of that higher temperature feature at about 185 Kelvin. And that's represented in this blue dot dash line here. And then as we anneal that surface up to 400 Kelvin, that will help to start to heal some of those pits within the surface. And we can see that the intensity of ethanol um, that's absorbed to those features is decreasing. Um, but we can't, we're can't. we not fully getting rid of all of our steps. We do have a, a fairly stepped surface. And so if we're looking at low coverages of ethanol, we can um, generally see a, a little shoulder here in this, in this peak. Um, so we can assign the 173 Kelvin to gold terraces. So if you're thinking about that on the atomic scale, moving away from a step edge where you have um, 
a higher coordination of gold atoms. You could have an ethanol sitting kind of far away from the step edge on the terrace site as compared to uh, ethanol sitting directly on a step site where you would have a lower coordination. Those molecules are gonna be bound a little more tightly and so we'll see molecules um, desorbing at higher temperatures. Terrace versus step edge site. Now, interestingly, as we dosed more and more ethanol, okay, so now we can see that this 173 Kelvin peak, we've able to, we're have able to saturate that. Now it's a little bit harder to see that step edge site, which is again around 185 Kelvin. It's kind of hidden now, um, but we can see the growth of the first layer of ethanol and the second layer of ethanol. And interestingly, we see this other additional peak pop up at 215 Kelvin. And if you take a really close look at that trend, then as we add more and more ethanol, so here, if you look at this uh, black line, 3.2 monolayers, we actually see that the terrace, this is the 173 Kelvin peak, has actually decreased in intensity. But this peak at 215 Kelvin has increased in intensity, almost as if we are taking what um, used to be ethanol adsorbed to terasites, and now we are kind of changing that concentration so that we have more uh, desorption uh, from these molecules that have been adsorbed to uh, under coordinated sites. And so we looked at data, uh, we looked at literature that showed um, carbon monoxide bonded to gold step edges and kink sites and looked at the um, energy of adsorption between kink sites and step edges. And that helped us arrive at this um, thought that this 215 Kelvin peak arrives from the kink sites. The really weird thing is that it this peak grows in intensity as we have more and more and more ethanol. And so um, this is a study that we published several years ago now, but this is something that we want to return to um, and look at through um, a DFT lens as well. So in summary of this of this section, we can look at the adsorption strength trend. And as you expect, we can see that uh, terraces are bonded to uh, ethanol is bonded to terraces more weakly than step edges more. And that's more weakly than kink sites. This is going to be really important when we uh, start to think about intermolecular interactions as well. OK, so this is the end of this first part. Any questions about ethanol on gold 111? Nothing in the chat window right now. OK. OK, so if we know about ethanol. Sorry, uh, sorry. Somebody was oh. a little slow on the draw. Oh, there. no worries. How, how did you calculate the monolayer cover? I guess it's how do you calculate the coverage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. So the way that we do that is um, if I just scoot back to here, what we do is we, you can see, perhaps you can see that there's this green peak here where we have um, one monolayer present. So basically what we're looking at is a saturation of that one monolayer peak. And then we go in through Origin Pro and look at the area underneath that monolayer peak. And then we can compare that to some of these um, other coverages as well. Ethanol gets a little tricky, but we basically just look at the saturation of this terrace peak and um, take the area under that curve. Uh, just the mass uh, 31, or do you take some of the fragments too? We, uh, we for this, looked at the mass of mass to charge ratio of 31 because that's the only one that we were looking at in this. That, that was to compare it to the other mass to charge ratios of 31 at other coverages, if that makes sense. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, okay, so um, I kind of led on that I would only be talking about ethanol, but uh, we have some pretty interesting results um, looking at some other alcohols as well. Uh, so I have a current student right now, Eric Maxwell, who um, has been looking at the series methanol, ethanol, and one propanol so far. Um, and as you would expect, um, here we're looking at desorption energy as a function of the carbon chain length. So as these molecules, as these simple alcohols get larger and larger and larger, you expect them to have higher desorption temperatures and therefore higher desor or larger desorption energies. Um, and that's related by the redhead first order approximation. And of course, that is in fact uh, what we see as you have larger molecules, there's a greater interaction between the molecules and the surface. And so um, they have higher desorption temperatures. But one 
interesting thing here is that if you look at the terrace uh, trend for just a moment, you can see that as we go from methanol to ethanol to one propanol, there is this increase. But that's the slope of this line is not the same as the slope of the kink site, indicating that the rate of the increase is different for these two different surface features, which we are relating back to intermolecular interactions. So I am going to bring up, here is um, a DFT uh, figure from um, one of Charlie Sykes' papers um, recently. And this in particular is one propanol on gold 111. But you can see here that these molecules um, are, and this is also, he also showed this using STM. Uh, but you can see that there is this hydrogen bond interaction on a gold surface that um, anchors these molecules in place. and there is an interaction between the, the carbon chains of these alcohols. So all of these alcohols are lined up, and so there's intermolecular interactions between these molecules. Now, if you have a molecule sitting on a terrace site, then you'll expect these types of interactions. But because we can see the difference between molecules adsorbed to terraces and adsorbed to kink sites, we can actually see those molecules um, that are kind of out there on their own, sitting out there on a kink site all on their own, and don't have that maximized intermolecular interaction like a molecule would on a on a terrace. And so what we can see here, I'm showing the slopes of all of these different lines. Um, and you'll see that the slope um, is larger for the terrace site than it is for the kink site. So again, I'll just reiterate that a molecule sitting out on a kink site is kind of on its own. And so you don't have that maximized intermolecular interaction that enhances and increases its desorption temperature. And so we can start to predict, okay, well, where, where do we expect one butanol is going to desorb from the surface? Well, um, we can say it's going to be around 65 kilojoules per mole just based on the slope of this line. One thing that we want to follow up on, again, this is a DFT from that same uh, paper, but if you notice looking at 2-butanol, 2-butanol has a different molecular packing on a gold 111 surface. The molecules aren't all aligned. You don't get that interaction between the carbon chains um, like you would on some of these other primary alcohols. And so how does that affect the desorption temperature of for example, one butanol versus two butanol. Because right now we're hypothesizing, okay, the kink sites, the, that difference in site is going to affect the desorption uh, and that has to do with intermolecular interactions. Uh, but this comparison of one versus two butanol where you have molecules of the exact same molar mass, that would really um, indicate whether or not we're, we're on the right track with this thought process. So that's going to be our next step. We're working on this currently. Um, students are getting back into the lab as we speak um, to wrap up one and two butanol so that we can um, figure out what's what's going on here. Uh, okay, so that's the second part of there, just looking at the trends. How are we doing? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Nope, let's keep going. Keep, keep on going. Okay. Um, the next part of this talk, thinking about alcohols being on the surface with other, with other species. Um, and we happened upon this um, on accident. Uh, I'll be real honest about that, but found some pretty interesting things. So what happens if we have something like deuterated ethanol around uh, and water on the surface? How does that affect desorption? So we can see in this plot here, we're just looking at a, a gold surface having a constant amount of deuterated ethanol on that surface and then slowly increasing more and more water uh, that's co-adsorbed on that surface. And basically how we do it is we dose ethanol first, we add ethanol on top of that. This is all happening around uh, at you know around 100 Kelvin and then we run the TPD uh, and look for desorption products. Okay, so as we add more water, we see more water coming off of the surface. This is a really good start. Uh, the weird thing though, was that we're, we're aiming for the consistent amounts of deuterated ethanol on the surface. So we should see the same amount of deuterated ethanol coming off of the surface as we add more and more water. And that's not what we saw. We actually saw less deuterated ethanol coming off of the surface as we added more water. So where is that deuterated ethanol going? 
Well, it's not really going anywhere. What we found is that there's an exchange between the deuterium and the hydrogen on that ethanol on the gold 111 surface. So you can see here, if we look at the fractional area of ethanol versus deuterated ethanol, we start off with a lot of deuterated ethanol. And as we add more water, this is as a function of uh, water coverage, we add more water and we see that that uh, amount of deuterated ethanol decreases, but, um, but ethanol increases. And so we're hypothesizing that there is some, um, there is some hydrogen deuterium exchanges exchange occurring between these molecular species on gold 111, which is particularly uh, surprising because gold is an inert surface. So it really tells you that the gold isn't doing anything except providing a space for these molecules to interact. Um, and Buddy Mullins has this paper from um, a few years back. He's looked at ethanol and also methanol and water and looked at the hydrogen deuterium exchange, but um, was using reactive atomic uh, hydrogen and deuterium in order to um, get that exchange to occur. And so we were very surprised uh, to see this happening. Um, and again, boy, I'm glad Charlie's here. He can see all the shout outs that I, that I give to him uh, in all of my talks. Um, so here we're looking at ethanol on a gold 111 surface, and you can see the hydrogen bonded network uh, where all, again, all of those ethanol, uh, the carbon chains are all aligned, maximizing those van der Waals interactions between, between the molecules. Um, but, but we're kind of expecting, okay, within these hydrogen bonded networks, if water works its way into those um, and then is able to uh, go through a Grothuis-like mechanism where you basically can have protons kind of working their way along water wires, that's common in biochemistry, um, then you can, you can imagine where this could happen uh, between molecular species on an inert gold surface. So uh, I had a I have a student Hassan. He's just recently graduated, but he was he wanted to look at fully deuterated ethanol to see okay is this exchange just happening on that acidic hydrogen uh, on ethanol? Is it happening on um, alpha carbons and beta carbons? And he found that no, it's really localized to just that OH uh, bond, which makes sense that this exchange is facilitated through the hydrogen bonding network. One interesting thing he did find was um, starting off uh, with fully deuterated ethanol, D6-ETOD, um, if he starts to add just a little bit of water on the surface or, you know, we just have background water essentially on the surface, if you start to add water, you see an increase in fully deuterated water. So there's two exchange processes that are happening on that water to form a D2O with a mass to charge ratio of 20. And that's the that's the first thing that's seen, basically. And then this kind of levels off. And then what we ex what we see after that is as we add more water, we get more water on the surface and more water coming off of the surface. And then the, um, the main exchange product we see is HDO. And that would be um, just the, the one exchange between hydrogen and deuterium. So again, uh, looking at... Uh, looking at Charlie's STM images, you can start to imagine where a water molecule would need to work its way into, into these chains, or perhaps even, because we're seeing this at such low coverages, um, low coverages of water, uh, is, it, is it perhaps happening within these pentamers? Is, is water getting within these chains? I'm sorry, I have an office helper today, so you can hear some giggling in the background. I apologize for that. Um, so you can, uh, so we start to think like, what are the surface, uh, what is the surface interaction of these molecules that would facilitate uh, two hydrogen deuterium exchanges um, to form D2O? Now, there has been some work done in uh, this. Can, can you tell us how you're doing the dosing? Are you backfilling the chamber? Do you have a localized doser? We're backfilling the chamber. So we we have collimated dosers within our uh, within our um, leak valves that are aimed towards the surface. So we're trying to get a collimated dosing, but it's um, you know it's all kind of handmade, and so really we're we're backfilling the chamber. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, so in solution phase, uh, adding methanol and water, uh, a solution on graphite, there's been some AFM work uh, at ambient conditions that has shown uh, some interactions between water kind of working its way into these hydrogen bonded networks. And so we're, we're trying to look into this a little bit more, but we'll need again to look at that through, through a DFT lens. 
Okay, so I talked a lot about the fundamental interactions between molecules on surfaces and how surface how molecules can sometimes affect surfaces. And I'm going to switch over to how surfaces affect molecules if there aren't any questions so far. Looks okay. Nothing. Okay. Well, there, there will be time for more. And um, what time do I need to wrap up? Just so I can uh, we usually up. shoot for about an hour. Oh, okay. But we so, have no real hard and fast, but right, right around there is... So just keep keep talking. Keep talking for as long as I can. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that to you. Okay. Um, so now let's get back into this whole thought process of titania on gold. So what happens when we dose titania on gold and then look at uh, ethanol? There is some work that's been done with uh, selectively getting ethanol to form acetaldehyde on gold 11 gold 111 surfaces and that's been by uh, depositing reactive oxygen onto the gold surface. Uh, so selective oxidation excuse me for one second. Can't talk. Got to be real quiet, okay? <laughs> She's talking to the dog right now. Um, okay, so you get this full uh, selective oxidation to form acetaldehyde, but then the oxygen runs out. And so our idea was, okay, well, if we use titania, then we have a source of oxygen on the surface that's pretty easy to regenerate. We just have to anneal the titania nanoparticles, the whole system um, in oxygen at high temperatures to regenerate that. And uh, the titanium uh, nanoparticles supported on gold, Similar systems have been used to study both 2-propanol and methanol, and similar stories were found with both of them. So with the 2-propanol, you can see, if you just kind of focus on the top part of this plot, that both oxidation products, so the formation of acetone, and the reduced product forming propene were both observed. The same was true with uh, methanol. So methanol comes off of the surface, but also so does the oxidized product formaldehyde and the reduced product uh, methane. And so ethanol hadn't been done. So we think, well, what will happen with ethanol? Can we modify and control this surface in order to um, promote selective oxidation? And so that's exactly what we're going to try to do. So we're going to look at ethanol um, and try to get some acetaldehyde to, to form and look at how we can modify the surface in order to, to push that selectivity. I've already talked about this a bit. We deposit titanium onto the surface in an oxygen background um, and anneal that at high temperatures to get these particles across the surface. And then um, we took the sample. Uh, we don't have XPS on our chamber, but we took this to Virginia Tech and were able to confirm the presence of titanium and oxygen. And then we have these nanoparticles across the surface. We're able to do ex situ AFM um, at JMU. And so what we ended up finding, and this is with nanoparticles, so we've got about uh, over half of the surface covered in nanoparticles. Um, what we found was a story kind of similar to what was seen with methanol and propanol. We see that we can form um, acetaldehyde. So we're looking at uh, several mass to charge ratios that fit along with that for acetaldehyde. Um, but we also saw some of the elimination product ethene. And so we knew we were able to get the reactive to happen, which is a great start. Um, but so far, we're seeing both products and we wanted to push it towards the oxidation. So how can we do that? Well, there's many different ways we can think about uh, titania coverage and um, affecting nanoparticle size and uh, maybe even looking at oxidation states. Uh, and we can do that uh, several ways, looking at how we're exposing um, oxygen and so I'll talk a little bit about what we did to try and, and understand uh, what's happening with this selective oxidation. Um, there was this XPS paper uh, previously published looking at the deposition of metallic titanium onto gold 111. And you see in XPS the features for metallic titanium. And then as more and more oxygen is exposed to the surface at elevated temperatures, about 500 Kelvin, you can see many oxidation states uh, arise from that exposure. And so 
uh, if they expose over 200 Langmuirs of oxygen at high temperatures, then they can get fully oxidized titanium nanoparticles. And that was that's mostly what we were working with. But we did we did do a few experiments where we tried to uh, mimic an experiment like this where we looked first of all at very low exposures of oxygen and then kind of worked our way up to fully oxidized ethanol. I mean, fully oxidized titania on the gold. And the experiments that I just showed, the results where I showed that we have, um, no, we didn't, we didn't see selectivity. That was a fully oxidized, uh, that was fully oxidized titania on gold over half of a monolayer. But we tried this and we used a much smaller coverage of titania. So looking at about 0.2 monolayers of titania, first dosing of very small amounts of oxygen. And we can see that we have some ethanol. We have a lot of ethylene that's desorbing from the surface. That would be the reduced product and a good amount of acetaldehyde as well. And from that paper that was written, you would expect many different oxidation states to be present on the surface um, with titania. If we add more oxygen, then we can start to see that this is a bit noisy, the ethylene um, peak, but you can see that this is a decrease in intensity and we have an increase in the acetaldehyde peak. And when we make our way to stoichiom stoichiometric titania, um, we we're barely seeing any ethylene at all and seeing only acetaldehyde. Um, and it looks like less overall, um, but we were able to see that selectivity. So it looks like with an increase in, increase in oxygen exposure, we're able to drive that selective oxidation of ethanol into acetaldehyde. And you are probably thinking, okay, yeah, you add more oxygen and you see more oxidation, that makes sense. But that selectivity is not observed when you're looking at uh, bulk titania, titania 110. Um, and we certainly didn't see that when we had larger nanoparticles of titania on the surface with a larger coverage. So there's this combination of making sure you have a lot of oxygen around, but also having small nanoparticles on the surface that is uh, where we're able to see this kind of selectivity. So just as a reminder, we did not see that with the uh, over half of a monolayer of titania on that surface. Okay, so this indicates that coverage makes a difference. And so if we deposit titania for one minute onto our surface versus a minute and a half versus three minutes, so the longer we deposit titanium, the more we have and the less selectivity we are able to see between ethylene and acetaldehyde. One other way we wanted to test this oxygen exposure was to kind of run through an opposite uh, experiment where we first started off with a fully oxidized titania uh, on gold surface. And look at the first TPD. You can see the selectivity for acetaldehyde was about 70% um, compared to ethylene. So this is, uh, this is a larger coverage. It's not that 0.2 monolayers. Um, and after that first TPD, where we're using up some of the oxygen within that titania and around that titania, we see that the selectivity decreases and then that trend continues for the third TPD as well. So we see that uh, oxygen uh, definitely makes a difference. Finally, uh, we worked with uh, Michael Nolan um, out of Tyndall Institute and he's looking uh, at DFT calculations for us, mimicking a very small titanium nanoparticle on gold. You're looking at the small titanium nanoparticles because that's where we see the most selectivity. Um, and kind of working through this process to see if we can understand a mechanism. Certainly having more oxygen around on the surface um, is important. We have seen that experimentally. And also in the literature, it shows that having molecular oxygen absorbed at the interface between titania nanoparticles and gold um, can certainly make a difference in reactivity. And so you can see that O2 adsorption is modeled um, at the interface here. And then ethanol adsorption uh, is on the titania nanoparticle. In this next stop, this next step, the acidic hydrogen uh, dissociates and forms ethoxy on the surface and uh, leaves an OH on the titanium nanoparticle. Uh, hydrogen can then migrate over to form uh, to form an OH on this oxygen. And then finally, the alpha hydrate, uh, the alpha hydrogen dissociation. Um, 
is able to occur, that hydrogen again also migrates over so that we're able to form water. And then the acetaldehyde is able to desorb. So we're just trying to think through the mechanism um, by which uh, this process would be uh, able to occur on the titania on gold surface. So that brings me towards the towards the end um, or to the end. So uh, at, just as a reminder, we're using surface science to understand interactions between molecules and between molecules and surfaces, not only seeing how molecules can influence surfaces, but how surfaces can influence molecules and their reactivity. Um, one thing that I've been really excited about is just being able to see these small concentrations of defect sites um, on the gold surface. Uh, we've done some work on silver as well. I didn't have time to talk about that today. Um, another interesting thing that we were very surprised by was this hydrogen deuterium exchange between molecular species on an inert gold surface. And then finally, um, being able to drive that selectivity and look at uh, the coverage of titania and the exposure of oxygen, um, we found that we're able to uh, selectively oxidize ethanol to acetaldehyde. So with that, uh, I think all of the students that have been involved in my lab over the years, um, they're the ones who have done um, all the work. And I'd also like to thank you for your attention. And so I'd be happy to, to open up the floor for more questions. All right, do we have any questions for our speaker? Okay, well, I, I have one. You mentioned um, when you put down the, uh, the alcohols and, and then dosed with water when they were deuterated uh, that you formed channels. Do you think if you use something besides um, ethanol where you had more steric hindrance that you could either pre prevent that that uh, reaction, the, the deuterium exchange, or would it, would it be enhanced? So one thing um, I can, I can, let me see, let me share my screen again, and then I can show you. Um, some of those figures. One thing that we were thinking about, um, let's see, I'm gonna come back up to that DFT image uh, from Charlie's paper looking at the two butanol. So if you are thinking about, okay, if we think that this kind of interaction between the water and the alcohol is occurring between or due to this hydrogen bonded network, if we can influence that hydrogen bonded network, then certainly we would see a change in, in that exchange that's occurring. Um, if we think about having hydrogen bonded networks, but forming in a different way, kind of like looking at this two butanol, perhaps that would give us some insight into what types of um, networks are required in order to get that exchange to occur. Um, but the bottom line is, is I mean, we're, we're dosing everything at 100 Kelvin. And so um, I, just, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for these molecules to move around. Um, and I also think that because we are seeing this phenomenon happening, happening during TPD, while we're heating up the surface, I mean, we are now getting lots of diffusion of the species all across the surface. So the question is, is, is this something that's happening on the surface at 100 Kelvin? when it's first dosed, is it because we're ramping up the temperature and inducing this desorption and allowing things to kind of migrate and move around and that's when the exchange is occurring? And so I think we'll have to go beyond TPD in order to, to really get a better understanding of uh, what temperature this is limited to, if this is uh, activated by um, tunneling or if this is induced by tunneling, I mean, we would be able to cool down significantly to, to see, but I, I don't think DF, um, TPD is going to help us in answering that. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. How do you control the particle size? I'm not sure which particle size we're talking about here. I, I... So that would be the titanium yeah. nanoparticles. Um, so I'm assuming, I'm making an assumption, Elizabeth. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's what I would go with. So um, the, the honest answer is that we don't 
control the particle size. We can't control the particle size. What we do control is the length of time that we are depositing titanium onto the surface. Um, and so if we dose, if we deposit a lot more titanium, then we'll see larger particles. Um, but we don't have a good way beyond that to control that. Okay. Uh, next question. Did you see any evidence of carbon-carbon bond scission or coking? We did not. So uh, there are no, uh, we did not have any evidence of carbon-carbon bond breaking with the ethanol. And so no coking either. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Uh, any other questions for our speaker? All right. So if um, everyone remembers... How we thank our speaker is we type applause in the chat window because we can't all speak simultaneously. <laughs> That's so <great>. applause, <laughs> applause. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't see many TPD talks anymore, but I love them. I think it is a great technique. I, I'm very impressed with the system you have. Um, I, your, your snout there that you have has to be very, very good to have that kind of control. So that, that is really impressive for, for a system like that. Can you tell us why you home built it? Uh, because of my budget. Yeah, that's usually it. That's, yeah. that's, that's what it was. Yep. So, um, so with my budget, I thought, okay, what, what can I, what can I build? Let's go for it. Um, and so, so that's why. So can you tell us a little bit about how you did it? Yes, I relied a lot on, I guess, for the uh, students and postdocs in the group, uh, I relied a lot on that network, uh, reaching out to graduate uh, advisors and postdoc advisors and postdocs that I worked with um, who had a lot of experience. And uh, there were a lot of a lot of pictures sent back and forth on setups and, and figuring out the best way to do that. Um, and then uh, a lot of, um, so I'm at a state school and so you would think that it would be really great to like go on eBay and find parts and pieces for a reduced cost. And so I'm not able to do that because we have vendors no. that we're allowed to work with. And so, so it, for, for us, you know, even if it's more expensive, you have to go with that preferred vendor. Um, but it was, it took a lot of, it took a lot of help <laughs> from a lot of people to build it because truth be told, uh, I had never built an instrument before. Um, and so that was a, that was a new, a new thing. And so I needed a lot of help. Well, I, I'm really impressed by that. And, and as Steve Tate says in the chat window, it's so great to see such beautiful TPD results. And, and I, I totally second, second that, that that's. Uh, you see so much bad TPD out there that uh, it, it's really nice to see truly outstanding TPD. And that's that, that's one of the reasons why I asked if you had differentially pumped the system. And, and it, it is working extremely well for you. And, and I can't wait to see more uh, of this as you go forward. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'll make one more announcement. Next month's speaker is going to be Scott Chambers from PNNL. And uh, we hope to see everybody again next month. And remember our, um, oh, uh, Charlie added great talk. So that's very good. Um, we, uh, we will try and get the announcement out for the September meeting uh, out as quickly as we can. I know uh, ABS headquarters is working on it, but please think about uh, preparing posters and poster presentations. And thanks everybody for coming and we will see you in September. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, thanks Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you.